I love that Seven opens with clear conflict between our two lead detectives. The same reason you had before you decided to quit, yeah? You, you just met me. The detail-oriented Somerset, who we are clued in on in the very first scene, is met with a clearly less stringent young hotshot in Mills, at a scene that is almost too horrific to show. Somerset is well attuned to detail in a given situation, even outside of his scope of practice. You can see it. What? While Mills can't seem to fully focus on the task at hand, including allowing a sense of entitlement, You've seen my files, right? You've seen the things I've done. Nope. Later hinted to be defensive in nature, to cause him to act in a childish manner. All to say that these two characters that we've only known for a few minutes immediately let themselves be known with a little sleuthing of one's own, set with a most gruesome encounter that is treated normal and abnormal at the same time. This playoff between characters extends to the rest of the cast, creating a sandbox for exploring some worldviews that affect and in a sense create each other. To really delve into Seven, we should start with a look at these characters. This is what it all meant. Who are you really? What do you mean? All I mean at this stage, what harm can it do to tell us a bit about yourself? It doesn't matter who I am. Who I am means absolutely nothing. You need to stay on your left up here. Mills, to me, is summed up in his visual. A kid in an oversized suit. His co-workers seem to agree, on a surface level, but I'd like to think he's not considered a child just because of his relative age difference. Mills is the kind of guy to shut his brain off when the going gets tough. At multiple points in his investigation, Mills is found to be lazing around, goofing off, or straight allowing others to do his work for him. Hello, man. Hey, He's also the kind of husband to, albeit playfully, call his wife childish insults while lavishing his pets in affection. Mills is that guy, the one that insults ideas, people, what have you specifically with homophobic slurs, so as to get his frustration out. He is, for all intents and purposes, a kid in a big suit. But why? The film makes a point of addressing the nondescript urban environment setting as affecting the inhabitants. Why don't you tell me what's really bothering you, Tracy? Look no further than Mill's own wife, Tracy. David and I are gonna have a baby. A woman in a career field all about improving life for children, which she herself doesn't want to bring in the world. Is Mills lesser than for not thinking about external factors on an aspect of life as grand as child rearing? Probably not. Sort of blocking the bad from one's mind is a pretty normal and even acceptable form of coping with all manner of horrors. Does it not make sense then that especially in his line of work, he would like nothing more than to simply live? Maybe even to the extent of simplifying people, perhaps categorizing them and say good or bad, or more appropriate for the story, normal and criminal. As much as one can look down on Mills, his simple mindset makes more sense than most of what happens in this movie, and it creates the perfect person for John Doe to latch onto. If your worldview made it such, that pretty much everyone was an irredeemable sinner in your eyes, including yourself, does forced attrition not make sense? For as little background as we get on the very intentionally named John Doe, we are still made privy to this character's warped mindset. I actually quite like that we don't get some sort of forced backstory or otherwise simple reason behind the murders. Instead, we get a perfectly crafted newborn of sorts. Clearly affected by his, once again, vague surroundings, John Doe is a man burdened by his thoughts. At one point it seemed good enough to make his thoughts flesh on paper, but an amazing visual cue clues us in on how confining that became over time. With that amount of pressure swirling around all day, action seemed inevitable, really. I mean, how does one sit by with all of that? In the case of John Doe, he didn't. He decided to craft and implement a plan that would so affect people that they would talk about it forever. Similarly to the filmmakers crafting the script and positioning the Mills character as the point of contact for John, to accomplish much the same for viewers. The handoff of the case in the beginning of the film 
the subsequent relationship between Mills and Doe, and the change in plans when Doe realizes his envy for that simple mindset, create the lasting impact this film has had. Beautifully realized with one of the greatest endings ever put to screen. But I digress, as that ending would have never been reached had Somerset not set things in motion. Somerset and Doe are a textbook case of parallel characterization. I could go all day about the similarities between the metronome and the diary as a ways of blocking out the horrific environment that envelops both characters. Each is extremely meticulous, each despises apathy, and each is incredibly intelligent. I just don't think I can continue to live in a place that embraces and nurtures apathy as if it was a virtue. You know different, you know better. I didn't say I was different or better. I'm not. But at the end of the day, these characters seem to be so similar as to make John Doe make sense. We can all understand that Somerset as a person would come over to a co-worker's house for dinner, end up staying to work extra time, his compatriot doing whatever they could do to get out of work, including getting drinks. We can understand that Somerset would ask for wine over beer and be so into the work that he never checks the glass. We can fully understand that he would think enough to feel rumbling that he knows to get worse, only then to realize what type of glass he was holding and give a knowing glance at the strange decision by his childish associate. This chain of events makes clear and immediate sense. What we can't immediately make sense of is binding another human being to a chair and forcing them to eat until their stomach and intestines burst. Over time, however, this too becomes as believable as the events of that dinner party. Somerset being a chief reason. And through him, we, hopefully, begin to see John Doe not just as believable, but possible outside of the realm of film. He's not the devil. He's just a man. You know, I understand you two were high school sweethearts. Mm-hmm. Pretty hokey, huh? Detective William Somerset is looking for a way out. You're retiring. Six more days and you're all the way gone. So how long have you lived here? Too long. Detective David Mills is looking for a way in. The structure of Seven is nothing new. The procedural feel, the characterization, the costume design, it all works to create a solid film even without the destination we eventually arrive at. Good uses of cliché at a bit of pretext that help establish a story as comfortable, believable, or palatable. This effect is reached in Seven. The film's Horrible depictions of violence are made less and more shocking for being placed in a pulpy detective thriller. Less due to the sense of familiarity, and more due to commentary of the hero of such tales. Oftentimes, even at their most flawed, stories in the vein of Seven create an evil that is caught or purged by the hero detective. There's a catharsis in seeing the monster being blown away by a flawed paragon of virtue. As contradictory as that statement seems. In another movie, Tracy would have been saved and John killed in an effort to protect the innocent, probably as a last ditch effort after a failed attempt at a call to reform in a big speech from Mills. Seven is not that movie though. Our hero is someone who's more likely to break protocol, including falsifying evidence, than to craft a stirring speech in hopes of saving two lives in one go. The ending of the film, as such, is not satisfying. It is horrifying. It takes something deemed acceptable and twists it into unacceptable, much as it does with everything. Bullshit. Even the most promising clues usually only lead to others. An oppressive tone is most often established with multiple points of use, chief of which is rainfall in Seven. Nearly every scene is drenched. Even when inclement weather is not actively enveloping the characters, it's present in the soundscape, or only absent due to budget restraints, according to David Fincher. 
Rain is interesting in that many people view it in its own context as being oppressive, despite being objectively life-bringing. Its use in many stories is that of a negative tonal nature, even as a visual metaphor for making positive out of negative in a film all about doing so, such as The Shawshank Redemption. I may be reading into things a bit here, but I believe this aspect of this weather condition is important to understanding the film. Think of this mindset moved from rain to the setting. Stick with me for a minute. The film has realism about it, shown through excellent radio chatter, procedural aspects to the writing, and thanks to Brad Pitt, a very sensible chase scene featuring Mills trying his best to chase an assailant he's none too clear of the whereabouts at any given time. This realistic nature sets a precedent for our belief that everything is fairly realistic, even for loftier subjects. You can't objectively say a place is depraved, but you can see its effects on people. So when so many characters talk about the setting city, we believe that such a place with no facts or figures to support it could be a place that breeds the apathetic or creates a general hostility. We can also believe that someone could force another person to kill a third party with a horrific sex toy despite never being shown these proceedings. In fact, giving us the aftermath and allowing our brains to work out the details doesn't just work as a way to build up the mystery of the killer, but also works to make those events seem more real. We might imagine how John Doe captured his victims or how efficient he was during his sessions. Throw away lines like, you know, this isn't gonna have a happy end. Or the set design being some of the most disgusting in film history don't just add a sense of scope, they work with other details to create a unified despair that only releases on occasion. Fincher and company set the stage, put the players in place, and crafted something even more horrifying than is immediately apparent from casual viewing. And they drenched it all in something that could be viewed as positive in a different light. I simplified completely. Apathy is a solution. I mean, it's, it's easier to lose yourself in drugs than it is to cope with life. It's easier to steal what you want than it is to, to earn it. Doing absolutely nothing is the most simple way of living. You don't need to educate yourself. You don't need to try and understand different viewpoints. You don't even have to think much at all as long as you can exist as some sort of minimum requirement. Well, how does one become better then? One could start with getting enough willpower to do something, possibly outside of themselves that not only helps those around them, but also gives a sense of satisfaction in oneself. This is a mentality that people often have worldwide from exaggerated nonprofit programs to hopefully well-established entities like law enforcement. John Doe is this mentality warped but approachable. Though never stated specifically, what Somerset says about people's apathetic nature can be viewed as almost propping up John's mission. He viewed the world as depraved, decided attrition and eventual self-punishment could make the world better through example or study. He set his mind to exhaustive planning with flexibility in the specifics, took to his plan, and in his and the film's final moments, succeeds. Where Seven became infamous is also where it triumphed more than any other aspect. From making him realistic, to creating a likable foil that we can appreciate, to creating dialogue that chastises characters for minimizing his humanity, to creating a believable, oppressive world, to making a stereotypical hero into a villain, etc, etc, the film creates an absolute monster that you and I and characters in the film He's experienced about as much pain and suffering as anyone I've encountered, give or take. And he still has hell to look forward to. Can absolutely empathize with. People will barely be able to comprehend, but they won't be able to deny. 
Could the freak be any more vague? I mean, this- John Doe is pretty well known as a placeholder name for an unknown person. Not an entity or a manifestation, but a person. The character of John Doe is so special because he isn't. His actions are outlandish, of course, but he is understandable. So, when John Doe changes his plans at the end of the film, you could say it's simply to create a shocking ending, sure. But if you truly see John as a person, you can unravel a bit of his thought process. He didn't do it just to shock people more thoroughly. He was genuinely caught off guard by a simple lifestyle. Not a good lifestyle, not a perfect lifestyle, but a normal lifestyle. This is where I think he was wrong about something. He states his final sin was envy alone, but I believe what he was envying was a sin in itself. Sloth. Who John should have envied was Somerset. As much as David Fincher did not want the last five minutes or so of the film, I believe it's important to see Somerset stay on the job. I believe Somerset, somewhere, changed his mind about his worth in society, no longer believing himself to be apathetic like so many around him. I believe he truly did only agree with the last half of that Hemingway quote. Thank you. If it's not obvious, I adore unique films. That's why I'm proud to be sponsored by MUBI. MUBI is an online cinema streaming exceptional movies from around the globe. They offer 30 amazing independent, international, and classic selections at a time. Every day, they present a new film, and every day, they take one away. Ruthless, yet wonderfully simple. No more endless scrolling. No more of the same old thing. No more stressful eye movements through thousands of random titles. Finally, a streaming service that is, above all, streamlined. I would currently recommend Shivers. It's an early David Cronenberg film that's part of a collection of horror films for the season. Try Mubi with an extended free trial by visiting mubi.com slash what it all meant. That's mubi.com slash what it all meant.